Penguin presents Henry VIII, The Quest for Fame, by John Guy, read by John Banks. Introduction Few monarchs have divided opinion more than Henry VIII. Inevitably so, because, besides doing more than any other English king to reshape the country's institutions and identity in roughly the form they survive today, he was also a willful destroyer. For those who opposed his attacks on the church and hefty demands of taxation, he was a vindictive tyrant who associated might with right and value with luster. He was, said John Hale, a priest of Isleworth in Middlesex, to be called a great tyrant rather than a king. Allowed his day in court by Henry before being sent to the gallows on a charge of high treason, Hale was determined to put his views on the record. Since the realm of England was first a realm, he insisted, was there never in it so great a robber and pillager of the Commonwealth read of, nor heard of, as is our king? Others have strenuously disagreed. For perhaps a majority of his subjects, Henry was everything a king should be. Capable of the best as well as the worst, he exuded magnificence, both personally and through his spectacular palaces and art collections. His children revered and adored him. Faced with disobedience from her own privy councillors, his daughter Mary, who was the country's first queen regnant, sometimes found it an uphill struggle to establish her authority, even with her closest supporters, declared that they would never have dared to do such a thing in her father's lifetime, and she only wished he might come to life again for a month. Not surprisingly, criticisms of Henry's policies were linked to attacks on his private life. Comparing him to the infamous classical tyrant King Dionysius of Syracuse, Sir Thomas Eliot wrote, He was a man of quick and subtle wit, but therewith he was wonderful sensual, unstable and wandering in sundry affections. Delighting sometime in voluptuous pleasures, another time in gathering of great treasure and riches, oftentimes resolved into a beastly rage and vengeable cruelty. About the public weal of his country always remiss, in his own desires studious and diligent. But while Henry had six wives and several mistresses, he was, by the standards of his royal contemporaries, sexually restrained and although two of his wives were executed and two divorced, it can be argued that dynastic security made such casualties necessary. Whereas those on the wrong side of Henry saw him as a tyrant, ruled by his sexual passions, others, especially nobles and property owners, keen to profit from the spoils of the annihilation of the abbeys, saw him as providing the essential stability that kept the country free of the civil wars that had plagued the 15th century, or the wars of religion that would bring anarchy to France and the Netherlands later in the century. Rather than attempt to vindicate the views of either side of the debate in this short reassessment, I will seek to look behind the mask into Henry's mind and explain how he himself understood events. How far did those of his childhood and adolescence make their indelible mark? What led him to shape his policies and choose his wives and ministers? Was he a ruler with genuine principles, or deeply held convictions, or simply an unscrupulous pragmatist? Was he devout, and therefore sincere in demanding the massive changes and destruction wreaked upon the church and the monasteries? What impelled him to attempt to become a commanding presence on the European stage, with all its immense costs, human and material? In particular, did his cruel streak come only latterly with age, disappointment and ill health, or was it always there? Keeping such questions to the fore will, I hope, open the door to unfamiliar as well as more familiar insights and enable readers to feel they can reach out and touch this charismatic and yet so difficult and complex king. Author's Note Dates are given in the old-style Julian calendar but the year is assumed to have begun on the 1st of January and not on Lady Day, the Feast of the Annunciation, i.e. the 25th of March, which was by custom the first day of the calendar year in France, Spain and Italy until 1582, in Scotland until 1600, and in England, Wales and Ireland until 1752. Spelling and orthography of primary sources in quotations are given in...
Sample complete. Ready to continue?